Today, most people think of Dorset as the archetypal rural county, as immortalised in the novels of Thomas Hardy. Yet in the Second World War, Dorset was frontline territory in the fight against Nazi Germany, whose forces lay just across the English Channel in occupied France. There are many aspects of Dorset's wartime heritage that have been all but forgotten, and this documentary uncovers some of the sites that helped to bolster Britain's defences, and also those that played a crucial role in the Normandy landings and ultimate victory. We start our tour of the war sites of the County of Dorset here on the Isle of Portland. And looking out over Weymouth Bay from here, we can see aspects of all that the county was involved in during the war. We have obviously Portland Harbour below us. In the distance, we have industry, the torpedo factory, Whiteheads at White Regis. The skies above us were very much to the forefront of the Battle of Britain. And below us, 103 war graves, Portland Naval Cemetery and the army. There were five artillery barracks, coastal defence barracks, around Weymouth Bay and Portland. Fort Upton, the Noth, the Breakwater Fort, the East Wears Battery and the West Wears Battery. There was another artillery fort built and opened in 1881, which we see behind me, Vern Citadel. But in fact, it was never used as an artillery barracks. At its completion, muzzle-loading guns were becoming obsolete, so it was never armed and in 1903, it had become an infantry barracks. During the Second World War, the Fern Citadel was used for a variety of purposes. The last regiment of infantry here was the 2nd Battalion, the Lincolnshire Regiment, and they left here and joined the British Expeditionary Force and were, of course, involved in the ill-fated evacuation of Dunkirk, Operation Dynamo. There was an RAF radar unit based in here during the war. There was an ammunition depot and the old magazine left over from the breech loading, muzzle loading transition days was actually used as an overflow hospital. In 1950, the War Office gave up the Verne and it was transferred to the Home Office and turned into a prison. And it remains a prison today, Her Majesty's Prison, the Verne. A total of 148 bombardons or Phoenix units were built for the two Mulberry Harbours, designed to bring troops, vehicles and supplies ashore after the D-Day landings. The British one was on Gold Beach at Aramanche, and the American one on the edge of the Omaha Beach. The American harbour was virtually destroyed by a storm on the 19th of June, and the Aramanche one, Mulberry B, often known as Port Winston, continued in use. And today, numerous sections of this harbour can still be seen offshore at Aramanche. In 1946, ten units were towed back to Portland to provide shelter for the construction of a new pier. In 1953, Eight were sent to Holland to repair the dikes after the great floods of the year before. But the two we see here didn't make the journey and remain in Portland Harbour to this day, officially listed buildings. This is West Weir's battery, also known as Black North Fort and it's the only one of the five coastal defence artillery batteries facing to the west. All the others had direct lines of fire over Weymouth Roads and Portland Harbour. The wartime fit here was two 9.2-inch artillery weapons. This is the ammunition store for the battery, and from here the shell case and the charge would go separately to be loaded onto the gun for firing. There were hoists at both ends to take it up to the two gun positions and auxiliary hoists which would actually be used if there was a main power failure. We have the two gun embrasures here, the 9.2 inch guns which later in the war were radar controlled. Sadly the time when they really would have come into their own they couldn't be fired. On the night of the 27th, 28th of April 1944, there was a major exercise taking place in Lime Bay, Exercise Tiger. German e-boats from Cherbourg got in amongst the friendly Allied convoy and wreaked havoc. There were 749 people killed in this exercise, more than the total lost on Utah Beach on D-Day itself. The radar plot was too confusing for the guns to open fire, although they were within range, because they couldn't tell which were enemy vessels and which were friendly ones. 
There's some small consolation. On one occasion, when German aircraft were attacking Portland, the Lewis guns here did manage to shoot down a German aircraft which landed on the Chesil Beach. Today, the fort is in use as a stable and private residence. we've come to the Portland War Memorial, which was unveiled in 1926. And of course, the Great War, 1914-18, was considered to be the war that would end all wars. But sadly, it wasn't to be. And the lower level shows those who made the supreme sacrifice in the Second World War. We're now in the Portland Royal Naval Cemetery, which as you can see is beautifully maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. There are 103 Second World War graves in here. 10 of them are of unknown combatants. One is a Norwegian merchant seaman. There's one Coast Guard and 12 Germans. No one grave, of course, is any more important than any other. But one that's best known on Portland is the grave of Jack Mantle the holder of the Victoria Cross. He was manning one of the starboard pom-pom guns on the auxiliary anti-aircraft ship HMS Fourbank when she was overwhelmed in a Stuka attack on the 4th of July, 1940. He maintained his gun position until he died and he's the first person to be awarded the VC in British territorial waters. Notice on the headstone, the Victoria Cross. This is Weymouth Noth Fort, completed in 1872 at a cost of £120,000 and sited on a commanding headland at the entrance to Weymouth Harbour with arcs of fire right across Weymouth Bay as far as the Portland breakwaters. Its main function in the Second World War was to site a coastal defence battery of six-inch guns, which we'll look at in a moment. But it also filled ancillary tasks, such as storage of anti-aircraft ammunition for all of the local heavy and light batteries. This weapon behind me is a 40mm Bofors, built in Sweden, light anti-aircraft gun. From this bastion, the highest point on the fort, the gun had a totally uninterrupted 360 degrees arc of fire over Weymouth, Weymouth Bay and of course Portland Harbour. This is the big brother of the Bofors. This is a 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun. During the war it wouldn't have been sighted here within the fort. The main battery was out on the glacis which is now the car park outside. At the beginning of the war the main heavy anti-aircraft gun was the rather obsolete Great War vintage three inch gun, but this replaced it extensively and actually at the end of the war there were also some 5.25 inch heavy anti-aircraft guns in use. It was 1st of April 1939 when I was uh, granted a direct commission in the Royal Engineers Territorial Army and uh, was posted to number one E. Ellen Works Company of the Dorset Fortress Royal Engineers TA. And in August, we were called up to action stations. And uh, my first uh, duty was at the Nose Fort. 
where uh, the uh, Royal Engineers were in uh, charge of the coast defence searchlights, whilst, of course, the gunners had the six-inch guns, uh, two on the nose and two on the breakwater fort. The main raison d'etre for the fort during the Second World War were the coastal defence guns, of which we see one here today. Breech-loading guns, they were never fired in anger during the war. However, one shell was fired from them in July 1940. A mystery boat arrived over the horizon and uh, refused to stop when it was ordered to do so. And so the number one gun on the nose was ordered to fire a shot across its bow, but the number one gun was misfire, so nothing happened. So number one on the breakwater was then ordered to fire a shot across its bow, which in fact it did, but the shell ricocheted off the water between the masts of the outer defence vessel and landed off down towards Lulworth somewhere. And the boat continued into Weymouth and unloaded French troops who had escaped from Dunkirk, so it wasn't a very good Welcome to Weymouth. Coming into the harbour below us now is a very important part of Dorset's military history. This is the motor vessel, My Girl. She was commandeered at the beginning of the war and her skipper, Ron Hill, stayed aboard her throughout the war and her task was to take supplies to and from Weymouth to the defences on the Portland Breakwater Arms. During the war, she steamed over 20,000 nautical miles in military service and she carried over a quarter of a million troops to and from the fortifications, plus, of course, endless amounts of supplies. Today, based still at Weymouth, she plies her trade in, amongst other areas, Portland Harbour, where she served so bravely over 60 years ago. The main defensive structure in Portland Harbour was the Breakwater or Checker Fort, and it was to hear that my girl would have made many of her passengers, sometimes under air attack. In 1956, coastal artillery units were stood down, apart from the one on Gibraltar. The fort rapidly fell into disuse and then was taken over by the Weymouth Civic Society and eventually became the excellent Museum of Coastal Defence that we see here today. The philosophy with anti-aircraft in Dorset and the country as a whole was to defend mainly vulnerable points, typically Weymouth Harbour, Portland Harbour and the Royal Naval Cordite Factory at Halton Heath. This is a 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft gun position, restored recently by the Robwell Trail Society, a heritage lottery fund and the local Weymouth builder Crumbleholm. The gun itself was on this area here and the retaining bolts are still underneath and these pieces of reese blocks which you can see have not been added they are actually what's left over from where the ready-use ammunition lockers were. Below here was the accommodation and when the gun crews went to action stations they came up some steps at the side here along the front and in where the camera is today. Weymouth was one of the most heavily bombed towns on the south coast during the war and someone who lived through that bombing as a young lad was Ken Wilkes, who joins us now at Newton's Cove. And I was there in Rainbow when it got bombed, in Oak Square when it got bombed. I was a couple hundred yards up the road from where the bomb dropped. And I believe your school was bombed as well? Yes, I was at Holy Trinity when, not actually when it got bombed, because it got bombed on a Sunday night. But I was there on the Monday morning, of course the school was bombed, so we were sent home again. And the bombing was September 1940, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. When the school holidays on, I was the unofficial stern sheetsman on the my girl. When the weather was bad, we used to run out of Binkley's here. Right. And where did they run to? Breakwater Fort. Right. All, all, all along the break, with A head, B head, C head, and Breakwater Fort. The morning they, they attacked the foil bank, the German planes come in from east side of Portland, coming low over the First World War hood that was sunk there to block the entrance off. And then bomb the fall bank, it was anchored just inside the hood. And then they come running across 
Chapley, where we was at school, and you could see the aircraft quite well, which we waved to, which we thought was our own aircraft, but it turned out to be German aircraft. Where were you the night the landmine actually dropped on Chapel Hay? Because that was the worst attack on Weymouth. That's Even right. it wasn't the most casualties, it was the most we, dramatic. We were, we were in Trinity Street then. We got bombed out in Oak Square and we went into Trinity Street. What we become Devonshire's offices after all of us families had turned out of there. After the landmine had gone off on Chapel Hay, it was all flat. Everything was flat right through Chapel Hay. There's not just an odd building here and there, but then uh, Nobody could live there, it was all flattened down. And they used it then for training for the services. Yeah. Commandos and all that used it for training. I'm now walking along the Robwood Trail, as it's called today, the line of the railway which ran between Weymouth and Portland. During the Second World War, it played a particularly important part in moving logistics into Portland Harbour as a build-up for Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings. On my left is the site of the former Whitehead's Torpedo Factory. And during the 1940s, as Portland became more and more important, it became obvious that if the road was bombed, there would be no access to Portland for stores. So an access road was built on the edge of the Torpedo Factory onto the railway line. Railway sleepers were kept in the Torpedo Factory area that could be put on the railway at 90 degrees to their normal lineation to allow traffic to continue through to the port. The Torpedo Factory was opened at the tail end of the 19th century. The foundation stone here was laid in 1891 by the daughter of Robert Whitehead, who of course invented the torpedo. Throughout the First World War, the Admiralty bought torpedoes from the factory, of course. In the 1920s, it went through a period of depression and actually closed down for a while, reopened in the 1930s, and of course was the main supply of torpedoes and to a small extent mines for the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. The last torpedo contract expired in 1946. The last firing of a torpedo in the ranges out over Portland Harbour in 1966 and taken over in the 1990s and turned into this beautiful housing development we see here today, Harbour Point. The harbour at Weymouth has obviously played a major part in the maritime history of the coast of Dorset, right back beyond the Spanish Armada of 1588. In the Second World War, initially it was known as HMSB, and the Royal Navy operated out here with motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats, carrying out offensive operations in the Channel. By 1943, the harbour was becoming very crowded. Dorset was part of the American build-up for Overlord. Most of the British forces were to the east of here. So the Navy came out, the Americans came in, HMSB became HMS Grasshopper for a short time, and then the US Naval Base Grasshopper. Another unit which was present in Weymouth Harbour was number 40 Air Sea Rescue Unit of the Royal Air Force. They were here from April 1944 to August 1945, and they're credited with the rescue of 11 downed aircrew and 99 people who had also ditched, rescued by other vessels at sea and brought back into Weymouth by the Air Sea Rescue launches. Over 99,000 American military personnel sailed from Weymouth to the D-Day beaches between the 5th of June 1944 and the end of the war in May 1945. The vast majority of them would have walked down these steps here to go onto the landing craft either for direct passage to Northwest Europe or to join the larger landing ships in Weymouth Bay for their voyage across the Channel. From here the troops were embarked for Omaha and the attack on the famous Point de Hoc, the ranger's assault up the vertical cliff face.
I'm talking now to Major Gerald Cousins. Gerald Cousins was in charge of a whole section of the local beach defences during the early days of the war when a German invasion was expected. Well, I was commissioned into the Essex Regiment, which was my county regiment, and then I found out that they were searchlights and I wasn't very keen, and eventually I transferred and became a, a Royal Engineer Sapper. And then eventually I was commissioned but they wouldn't allow us to go into the Royal Engineers, so I went back into my county regiment. And they were based down here on the Chesil Beach. I had 18 miles of Chesil Beach as a defence business. The Navy had been here before us and had laid mines all along the place. And when the Royal Engineers lay mines, they'd lay them to a pattern. But when the Navy came along and said, we're liable to be invaded, we'll just chuck some mines in, we'll mix them all up, anti-personnel, anti-tank the lot, and threw them down and put a barbed wire fence around each piece. But they had no record of how they'd been laid. Well, we had three mines go off in one field, and some of my friends in the unit were trying to get back to their base, or to their billets, and uh, they walked over the, over the fence and straight in. The first man was blown to bits, the second man was seriously injured, and the third man, who was <laughs> very tight, was as sober as a judge. <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> Montgomery was the corps commander, and Templer was his senior deputy, and they came along and they said they wanted to put what was called a Z1 obstacle along the beach which is impervious to tanks. It's a steel scaffolding affair, which makes a huge fence, and if the tank's tracks hit it, the tracks would be ripped off and they'd be put out of action. And we started off and we built it in sections down the beach, and it was a pretty good job. I don't think they would have ever got through it. So as well as the um, anti-tank devices you were building, there were uh, presumably pillboxes and observation yes. posts and everything else on them. All there. the pillboxes were built by the Navy before we came, and uh, they put in six-inch naval guns, but they'd shortened the barrels, and they'd never fired them with, with a shorter barrel. And we had ammunition, and we had the guns in place over the beach. Fortunately, we were never asked to fire them. Although during the Second World War the Germans never actually invaded Britain, during the summer of 1940 they issued several plans for just such an undertaking. The most important of these was probably that issued in July 1940, which involved a landing by some 200,000 men on a wide front between Ramsgate and the Isle of Wight, the main objective of which, of course, was to capture London. A subsidiary landing by about 60,000 men of the Sixth Army was also to take place and these men were to be ferried across from the Cherbourg Peninsula to land in the Lime Bay and Chesil Beach area, where they were to establish a bridgehead. Now, their main objective, actually, was to draw the British forces away from the main landing area on the southeast coast. But it was also uh, part of the plan for them to make a very fast motorised drive across country towards Bristol, which they were to seize. And this, of course, would have resulted in Devon and Cornwall being separated from the rest of the country. During the second phase of the operation, by which time about 820,000 men would have been committed, another fast mechanised drive would have been made up from Bristol towards Gloucester, from where a powerful left hook could be delivered into the South Midlands. It was then considered that once the line from Gloucester across country to Maldon and Essex had been held, no reasonable resistance could then be expected from any of the remaining British forces, and effectively the invasion would have been complete. Montgomery issued an order of the day. I've never forgotten it. I think it was one of the most frightful things that they ever said. He said, the beach defenders have got to hold the beach for 30 minutes. After that, make your own way back and find another unit to join. And that was about it. Had the invasion actually taken place, which the British Army later freely admitted would have probably taken only about a week. One of the first airfields to be captured would, of course, have been Warmwell down in Dorset. Here, RAF Spitfires would have been quickly replaced by Stuka dive bombers, 
which have already operated from their French bases to destroy Dorset's fixed defences, such as the coastal gun sites and the heavy anti-aircraft sites in the Holton Heath group, which were installed to protect the nearby Cordite factory as well as Portland Harbour itself. The bombing range is off the Chesil Beach, opened in Lime Bay on the 1st of September 1937, and they were used for bombing, gunnery, air-to-air -air and air-to-ground, and rocket projectile training. Primarily, the activity was on three moored targets in West or Lime Bay, but also some fire and Hessian targets on the adjacent mainland and beach. The ranges were supported by the airfields at Warmwell and a small satellite airfield at Chickrell on the outskirts of Weymouth. Perhaps the ranges here are best known for the bouncing bomb trials which took place between the Chesil Beach and the mainland, we call it Little Sea, during the winter of 1942-43, using modified Wellington Mark III aircraft and reduced size dummy bombs. The first drop took place on the 4th of December 1942 and the last on the 8th of March 1943, before the experimental team moved away to Reculver in Kent for full size trials in Lancaster aircraft. All the trial flights except the first, which operated from Weybridge, operated from RAF Warmwell. Operation Chastised on the night of the 16th and 17th of May 1943 saw the morale-boosting successful attacks on the Mona and Ada dams by 617 Squadron, but with the tragic loss of 53 lives. Britain was the only country in Europe to have a resistance organisation organised before it was invaded, and of course, Britain never was invaded. The resistance in the UK were known as auxiliary units, a choosedly ambiguous name. And the people involved and enrolled were people who had an intimate knowledge of the land, farmers, gamekeepers, forestry workers, poachers and the like. The idea was they would go to ground in one of their observation posts, known as operating bases, such as this now long gone one here near Langton Heron. And after the Germans had landed on the south coast and made their way inland, they would come up behind the German forces to wreak havoc in their lines of communication. All those involved considered it very much a suicide job, but nevertheless, they were proud to be members. There were 32 of these bases on the south coast of Dorset, all built to pretty much a standard design. The operations room had sleeping facilities, cooking facilities, and of course, storage for weapons and explosives. The entrance was controlled remotely by pulling a rope through a pipe to a point slightly away from the base so that the entrance door would open and the troops could come in and out. And there was also an emergency exit so they could egress quickly if they were attacked. The organisation continued in existence until November 1944 when it was stood down as the Allies were pushing into Europe and the chances of an invasion within the UK were down to virtually zero. Dorset's county town, Dorchester, which has its origins back in Roman times when it was known as Dernaveria. The Dorset Regiment's origins go back to when it was raised as Colonel Coote's Regiment and then eventually numbered the 39th Regiment of Foot. The battalions of the regiment have fought in virtually all major conflicts since then and it has the honour of having not just one but two mottos. Primus in Indus, relating to its first battle honour in India in 1757 and Marabout, relating to its capture of Fort Marabout in Egypt in 1801. I'm standing on the balcony of the keep to the Poundbury Barracks in Dorchester. This was completed in 1879, the remainder of the barracks having been built in the 1790s. During the war, the regiment grew to nine battalions and saw service in France, Malta, Sicily and Italy, Burma and Northwest Europe. The 1st Battalion, together with the 1st Battalion of the Hampshire Regiment, were the only two battalions of the whole British Army to take part in three assault landings, Sicily, Italy and Normandy. In the autumn of 1943, or the fall as they would have called it, part of the barracks were taken over by the US Army. When the Americans embarked for Normandy, the US presence dramatically reduced, but the barracks continued to serve as a supporting depot for the Dorsets in Europe and as part of the Forgotten Army in the Far East. In one of the countless cutbacks which the politicians have forced upon the armed forces in the last 60 years or so, the Dorsetshire Regiment lost its individual identity in May 1958, 
when it amalgamated with the Devonshire Regiment to form the Devons and Dorsets. And shortly thereafter, the barracks was declared surplus to requirements and all but a small portion sold off. On the 1st of February 2007, the Devonshire and Dorset Light Infantry went under yet another change and are now part of the country's elite rifle regiment. How are the mighty fallen? This is the back of the barracks today. On the left, where the married quarters were, stands a tax office. And the hallow parade ground is now nothing but a car park. At the far end, we can see what is known as the Little Keep. And then on the right-hand side, the former military buildings, which are now used mainly by the post office. Colin, the museum was established in this barracks uh, in 1929 by the Dorset Regiment, and it's been here in the keep since then. It was refurbished about 12 years ago as the Military Museum of Devon and Dorset and incorporates regiments from those counties, not just the Devonshire and Dorset Regiment, but it includes the yeomanry in both counties as well. Yes, we're very lucky in Dorset in having three excellent military museums, the Tank Museum at Bombingdon, the Royal Corps of Signals Museum at Blanford, and this excellent, truly excellent museum in Dorchester. And what I like about it is so much hands-on, it's so very user-friendly, especially for the youngsters coming in here. Presumably that's intentional. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's all about education, it's all about interpretation, and we are now developing our website in a similar way. I, I would add that we actually do have two galleries also in Devon, one in Plymouth and one in Barnstable. This is the Dorchester Town War Memorial and it's based on the Edward Lutyens design cenotaph in Whitehall and likewise is made of Portland stone. The memorial was dedicated on Empire Day 1921 and contains 237 names from the Great War. New panels were added in 1948 and 49 to include 81 Second World War casualties. Sadly, Peace in the world at large still eludes us, and other names have been added from post-war conflicts. We've now come over to the western side of the county of Dorset, to the town of Lyme Regis, and we're in the church of St Michael the Archangel. Particular interest here is the bell of the Bangor class minesweeper HMS Lyme Regis. Above us we can see the ensign which she flew actually on D-Day when she was part of the support force for the Overlord landings. This was in fact the second HMS Lyme Regis to be named during the Second World War, and she took the name from HMS Sunderland. Ironically, at the end of the war, the second HMS Lyme Regis was scrapped on Wearside. HMS Lyme Regis was but one of 13 warships to bear Dorset names during World War II, probably the most famous being the Norfolk-class cruiser HMS Dorsetshire, which administered by torpedo the coup de grace to the German battleship Bismarck in May 1941 after she had been disabled by swordfish aircraft from the carrier HMS Victorious. She herself was sunk by aerial attack some 200 miles off Ceylon in April 1942. Not a warship, although well armed with anti-aircraft weapons, the SS Dorset certainly also deserves a mention. She was the eighth and last merchant ship sunk in the famous pedestal convoy to Malta in August 1942, not succumbing to enemy action until almost in sight of the island fortress. This was the famous Ohio or Santa Maria convoy which saved Malta from almost certain capitulation. This is the former headquarters of the Lyme Regis Air Sea Rescue Unit. It was formed in 1937 primarily to support the activities of the aircraft using the bombing ranges off the Chesil Beach. In 1942 it was entitled Number 37 Air Sea Rescue and Marine Craft Unit. Today the unit is used as a boating academy. It was actually closed down in 1964 when helicopters began to take over most of the RAF's UK air sea rescue commitment.
We've come up now to the northwest corner of Dorset on the border with Somerset near Crookern to a place called Winyards Gap. And here we have the memorial to the 43rd Wessex Division. And it commemorates the first battle that they took part in in the Normandy campaign from the 10th to the 24th of July 1944. Operation Jupiter, the campaign up the Oden Valley River. The monument is a replica of the memorial on Hill 112, which is five miles southwest of Caen. And the Germans said, he who holds Hill 112 holds the battlefield of Normandy. The battle for Hill 112 was ferocious. Despite German reinforcements being thrown into the fray, it was a classic infantry victory against very heavy odds. The memorial commemorates those who fell between the D-Day landings and the arrival of the division in the Baltic in May 1945. Over 12,400 of its personnel were killed, wounded or missing in action before VE Day. The wyvern atop the monument is most significant. The most significant of all divisional emblems worn in the campaign to retake Europe having first been worn in battle by King Alfred's troops in AD 879. We've now come up to Sherborne with its beautiful abbey where Christians have worshipped their Lord for over 1300 years. And behind the town's First World War Memorial we have the memorials to the Second World War. Three plaques commemorating the 56 citizens who gave their lives during the war. A plaque which commemorates a raid on Yeovil Airfield in September 1940 just as the crow flies or as the JU-88 flies a mile and a half down the road. Obviously the bombs undershot their targets and the casualties were incurred here in the town and 18 people died. These two plaques at the bottom here commemorate the 29 members of the 294th Engineer Combat Battalion who were killed near here in a landmine explosion in March 1944 as they trained for D-Day. The second plaque commemorates a visit by the survivors in later years. This is the Lady Chapel of Sherborne Abbey, which is also the chapel for the Dorset Regiment, originally, of course, the Dorsetshire Regiment. And within the chapel, all the laid-up colours of the regiment are displayed. Also on the wall is a lovely example of the regimental badge with its unique two mottos. This chapel was dedicated after the Great War, but updated after the Second World War, and we have this lovely screen on the south side of the chapel commemorating the battles in which the regiment fought. Now virtually returned to nature, this was the site of the American 228th Army Hospital in Hayden Park to the southeast of Sherborne. A capacity of 1,100 patients split over 28 wards. And it was one of many hospitals in the county in 1943 and 44, which were built to accept casualties from the battlefields of Northwest Europe. Under favorable conditions with a good tide and shipping movements tied in, Casualties could be off the battlefield and into the operating theatre here within eight hours of being wounded. As we've already seen on the war memorial in Sherborne, in March 1944 there was a tragic accident in the park below here. Combat engineers working with landmines. 
And although 29 of them were killed, the closeness of this hospital meant that many were saved. And in fact, some of them made such a good recovery that they were able to land with their colleagues on the beaches of Normandy just after D-Day itself. The wars in Europe and the Far East over, the hospital closed in December 1945, but continued to be used until the 1950s as a camp for Polish refugees. A combat force, of course, is only as effective as its logistics chain, and here is a prime example of the logistics chain being reinforced, the bridge we see in front of us. We're now at the village of Bagba, just to the west of Sturminster Newton on the A357 and on the banks of the River Lydon. As the build-up went ahead of the armed forces going to Weymouth and Portland for shipment across the channel, the Americans were very concerned that the old bridge might not take the weight of the tank transporters. And so Canadian engineers built this girder bridge as a temporary measure so that the tanks could come south on that road. And as you can see now, nearly 70 years later, the bridge is still here today. We've now come to the town of Blanford Forum, pretty much in the centre of the county of Dorset. And these two anti-tank devices in front of me form part of a quite remarkable story of this area, which I'll tell you about from the bridge over the River Stour. It's difficult to imagine on this peaceful summer's evening that the beautiful River Stour could actually have been a part of a tactical plan formed for the ground to the south of Blanford Town and the Blanford Army Camp. This area here was designated an official anti-tank island bounded by the River Star and the embankment of the old Somerset and Dorset Railway. Artillery located on Blanford Camp was zeroed into this area, the idea being that any German forces moving up from the south coast, from the Weymouth or Chesil Beach areas, would be ready targets waiting to be slaughtered by gunfire. We're now on the taxiway of the former airfield at RAF Torrent Rushton, just on the outskirts of Blanford Forum. It was opened in May 1943 as an Airborne Forces airfield and was the main base for the 6th Airborne for the D-Day landings. Units of the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry under Major John Howard flew from here in gliders towed by Halifax tugs to attack the two bridges at Ramville. The canal bridge, later to be called Pegasus Bridge, and the other bridge over the River Orne. The Scuder Main was completely successful Surprise was achieved and the landing of the gliders, five of which out of six successfully reached their targets, considered by many to be amongst the most amazing flying feats of the whole of the war. The task was to prevent the Germans breaking into the eastern end of the beachhead. Tarrant Rushton acted as a reception airfield for the two major local hospitals at Blanford Camp and Kingston Lacey. Later in the war, it was the main airhead for Operation Market Garden, the battle for the bridge at Arnhem in September 1944, the bridge too far, and later Operation Manor, the airdrop of food to starving civilians of Holland in May 1945. Amongst the impressive structures remaining are two T2 hangars. on the eastern side of the county of Dorset at the former RAF Hearn airfield. It was opened early in 1942 as an Ibsley airport satellite. Ibsley over in Hampshire was a fighter airfield. In March of 1944 the resident RAF squadrons were replaced by a Royal Canadian Air Force wing flying the deadly Typhoon fighter bomber which of course was later to achieve great success in hindering the German retreat from Normandy and the Falaise Gap killing ground. 
The final operational sorties from here were flown by B-26 Marauder medium bombers of the United States Army Air Force. In October 1944, the military presence gave way to a civil one, and BOAC moved in and used Hearn as Britain's main international airport prior to London Heathrow opening at the beginning of 1946. Today, former RAF Hearn is Bournemouth International Airport, boasting a 7,500-foot main runway, a secondary north-south runway, and flights to destinations all over Europe and even across the Atlantic. Pool Harbour, the second largest natural harbour in the world, played an active part in defensive and offensive operations during the war. From boatyards to flying boat units, both coastal command and civilian, from combined operations activities at the HMS Turtle shore base to trials for Pluto, the pipeline under the ocean to supply fuel to the forces in Normandy via an intermediate pumping station at Shanklin on the Isle of Wight. From American Coast Guard rescue cutters to the embarkation of troops in over 300 craft for Operation Overlord. As the war progressed and the fortunes of war swung in the Allies' favour, space was always at a premium and units came and went as the fortunes of war dictated. To defend against seaborne attack on the harbour, on Brownsea Island two 4.7 inch naval guns and a controlled minefield with block ships at hand covered the entrance to the harbour. Most of the relics left over in Dorset from the war years are either buildings or perhaps items which are preserved and are now in museums. But what we have here in Poole Harbour is rather unusual. These are two Mark V landing ships tank, which were sunk intentionally after the war to provide protection while further harbour works were carried out behind them. They're still here in the 21st century, quietly rotting away. This is the Royal Naval Cordite Factory on Halton Heath, between Poole and Wareham. Opened in 1916 during the Great War, it was here to produce flashless cordite and tetral HE for Royal Naval guns. The site on Halton Heath was chosen as it was remote enough to minimise casualties should an explosion occur. In fact, in 1931 an explosion did occur on the site known as Nitroglycerin Hill, killing 10 workers. It had a suitable water supply and had a good railway connection, in this case, the Southern Railway. Holden Heath had its own generating plant. It also had its own hospital, fire brigade and home guard unit. I packed flashless cordite, which was used for the Mediterranean area of the Navy and it was highly dangerous. We had to wear protective uniform. My day consisted of on the early morning shift, getting on the train at Swanage at seven o'clock in the morning and going to Holton Heath by train. I was previously a nurse, but was conscripted to work for a factory by the government in 1941. After I trained in the experimental cordite bay for a week, I was given a Red Cross spot. I was trained to treat anybody who was injured, especially the outside men who pushed night and day trucks along a railway track, narrow gauge, to the stoves where the cordite was dried out. And there were many small accidents where I had to be called out from my job packing cordite. There was a section of Holden Heath which dealt with tetral, uh, a substance used for depth charges, and it was very dangerous work, very complicated work. 
the women used to powder their faces when they came off duty because using the fumes from the tetral used to impregnate their body and turn their skin yellow. They had extra rations for this and it was quite popular to go in for because they got extra eggs, meat, milk. But um, I dare say in afterlife, I wouldn't think there was any of them alive now. The scene in front of us looks rather like a typical North German plain with a Luftwaffe flat tower in the background. But in fact it's not. The structure is on the western edge of the Cordite factory. It was a twin Bofors tower, a single Bofors gun on two towers which was separated by a small gap so that when the gun was firing, the observer and tracker didn't suffer the vibration of the gun platform. The Cordite factory at Halton Heath was the most heavily defended, anti-aircraft wise, vulnerable point, as they were correctly known, in the county of Dorset during the war, more heavily defended even than Port and Dockyard from an AA point of view. Studland Bay was one of the places where the British considered the Germans might attempt an assault landing, especially, of course, in the summer and autumn of 1940. It was defended in the conventional way by pillboxes and anti-tank defences, and something special here was Prosit Fugas, which was a pipeline system under the water which pumped oil up onto the water and which could be ignited. It worked occasionally. Sometimes when the tide was right and the wind was right, it worked very well, On other occasions it quickly went out. But this structure is not part of the defences. This was actually built to allow senior officers to watch practice landing exercises in the bay later on during the war. In the first of the exercise smash series, seven Valentine tanks were launched in Sutherland Bay to be part of the assault landing force. Unfortunately, the weather was a bit rough and all seven of the tanks sank, with six of the crew members being drowned. A tragic loss, but part of the process that allowed the Sherman tanks to be perfected and used on D-Day by the British forces on Gold, Juno and Sword beaches with great success. This monument itself was unveiled in 2002. So this is Fort Henry. And on the 18th of April 1944, the King, Montgomery and Eisenhower came here with their other officers to watch a practice landing on the beaches below us. They came down by train to Swanage on what is now the Preserve Railway, stayed overnight in the hotel before coming here for the early morning attack. Dorset was very much considered defensive and offensive. In the early days of the Second World War, it was a bastion of defence, awaiting landings on the beaches such as those at Studland and further east towards the Sussex coastline. And then, of course, later in the war, when things began to turn in the Allies' favour, Dorset became a springboard for attack. The D-Day landings, a lot of the forces went across from Dorset. And indicative of the fact is that this structure was built in 1944 and it completely obscured the field of fire of this gun position here, which was built at the beginning of the war. With Longworth Castle in the distance there on this misty morning, we're now looking out over the Army training ranges where the Royal Armoured Corps exercises today. Armoured warfare in the form of the early tanks first came to Dorset in 1916, and in 1917, 18 and 19, more land was acquired for their training purposes and trials, of course. In the Second World War, the two camps at Bovington and Lulworth, which still exist today, were used as rapid response centres so that if there was a landing on this section of the coast, armoured columns could be sent out from there to combat it. Today, the Army's armoured fighting vehicles, now of course in the Royal Armoured Corps, no longer the tank regiment, exercise on these planes below us, Challenger 2 main battle tanks, right down to things such as the Scimitar fast reconnaissance vehicle. Dotted around the ranges, are tanks, abandoned tanks, like the ones you can see behind me. 
and these are used for targets or for practice targeting in isolation. There are not as many tanks on the battlefield training area today as there used to be. Following the end of communism in its red packed form, a lot of the tanks here were actually blown up under the terms of the strategic arms limitation talks, the SALT talks, and later ones to reduce, at least theoretically, the amount of armour available to the NATO forces. Live ammunition is used on the ranges, and of course sometimes the gunfire is extremely accurate, as we can see here. This is the coastal village of Tynan, a farming and fishing community nestling in underneath the Purbeck Hills. Life changed forever here in the late autumn of 1943 when the village was commandeered to allow the American troops based in this area to use the village for combat training. Now it is but a tidy ruin. Why did the Americans need to come here for their combat training? A lot of the troops were brand new. They hadn't served in North Africa or in Operation Husky, the Sicily landings, and then the movement up through Italy towards the border with Austria. They needed to do live training. They needed to be somewhere where their guns could be fired. And of course, firing guns caused the village to become the ruin it is today. Every attempt has been made to conserve the village. It is now what is known as a tidy ruin. You can see the door frames have been reinforced and all along the top of the open stonework, concrete has been applied to stop the water getting in and making the ruin any worse. It can be really said that a lot of the combat training which was so effectively used in Normandy, the skills were honed here in the village of Tynum. But fortunately, there are two buildings still left undamaged today. The beautiful church, which you see behind me, and over here, the village schoolroom. And within the schoolroom today, there's a lovely exhibition portraying the history of Tynum over the ages. The village is open to the public virtually every weekend and throughout the month of August. So you can come here and see the history of this lovely place for yourself. This unusual object here is an Alan Williams steel turret, a single man pillbox, and the top of the turret could rotate, and as the soldier inside moved his shoulders, the turret on a ball race would move around with him. There were 199 produced in the Second World War for the defence of the British Isles, only two of them in Dorset, this one at Warborough Bay, and another one a further east of here, beyond St Albans Head, at a place called Seacombe Bottom. Just a single soldier in here on his own, possibly from the Home Guard, and I can't help thinking how scary it must have been here in isolation in the summer of 1940, when invasion really did seem a possibility. I'm on a little beach at the moment, just to the east of Warborough Tout, which is on the Dorset Jurassic Coast. And what we're coming to now is an impressive line of dragon's teeth. Now dragon's teeth were put in places for a specific reason. And here the idea was that if any enemy force chose to land in this little cove, it would know it couldn't get its armour inland because of the dragon's teeth and would therefore have to go round Warborough Tout onto the more open beach in Warborough Bay where the defences would have been ready for it the Alan Williams steel turret and the other pillboxes high up on the cliffs above the bay. As we leave Tynum and climb up towards Whiteway Hill and the Purbex proper, one last thing we need to look at is this structure behind me. It's a 20mm light anti-aircraft gun position. You might ask yourself, why? Well, when the troops were down here with training, of course, they were as vulnerable to air attack as they would have been over on the distant shore only 60 miles to the nearest German airfields on the Sherberg Peninsula. So whilst the training was in taking place here within the village, this gun position would have been manned probably by units of the 184th LAA Battalion.
We've now come out to the site of the Royal Air Force Station at Warmwell. The memorial stone, erected in 1989, commemorates those who served here, not just the Royal Air Force, but the United States Army Air Force and military personnel of other nationalities who fought and gave their lives from RAF Warmwell. It's hard to believe, looking at this massive hole in the ground, that this was once an operational airfield. But in fact, it was a very, very important operational airfield. When the Battle of Britain broke out, it wasn't just confined to Kent and the southeast. It came as far west as Portland Harbour. And aircraft from here were used to intercept the Germans attacking Portland Harbour. The first squadron to come down here was 609 Squadron from Middle Wallop. But they just came down on a daily basis and went back to Middle Wallop on Salisbury Plain at night, an inefficient use of the assets. Then number 152 Squadron came down here from RAF Acklington in Northumberland, and the game was really on. As the RAF went over from defensive to offensive, fighter bombers operated over mainland Europe from Warmwell, included Hurricanes, twin-engine whirlwinds of 263 Squadron, and later Typhoons. Early 1944, the station was taken over by the Americans and the United States Army Air Force came here and opened Station 454 using their P-38 Lightnings in the ground attack role in the build-up to Overlord. But by August, the USAF had gone and the RAF were back here until close down in 1946. Our guide around the airfield at Warmore is Steve George. What I'd like you to do, please, Steve, is show us some of the artefacts remaining here in West Knighton Woods on the western boundary of the old airfield. As we walk around the boundary of the old airfield, we see different shapes in the ground where people might not otherwise sort of see things. You see zigzags in the ground here and here might indicate that there was a bomb shelter. And when you look very closely, right here, You've got actually a cave-in of corrugated iron and the stakes that supported the walls of the bomb shelter itself. Over time, weather and the weight of the earth on top has actually made it fall in. What we have here, Colin, is a, a ground crew building, obviously. Blast walls on the outside and what remains of the foundations of it right here, but buried again underneath the leaves. Something that we need to look out for as we're wandering around. As we're walking along the boundary again, you start to see mounds appearing on the side. These are actually revetments where aircraft were put in for protection from strafing of enemy aircraft in the area. And just as we saw the 152 Squadron carving in the tree at the revetments further over in the woods, this set of carvings is not RAF but USAAF. And here we have Madison County, USA, and really rather poignant is this here, 1944, June the 11th. And that was about the time that 454 fighter group pulled out from Warmwell and moved across to Europe. The bark has fallen away from the tree here, so the four is rather obscured, but we really have the evidence here. June the 11th. If this had been done by a Brit, it would have been, in those days, 11th of June. This building is probably the most significant of those left on the former RAF Warmwell site. Now used as a village hall, it was used during the war years as a YMCA, mortuary, naffy, and a variety of other purposes. We're standing now on the road which goes from Crossways to Dorchester, which actually follows the lineation of the old Eastern Taxiway on the boundary of the airfield. This building here is the former control tower. It's been converted now to a lovely private residence, but close examination will reveal its original use. This here is one of the old panhandle dispersals, a narrow neck where an aircraft of about Spitfire size would come in off the taxiway and then swing round here, probably with an airman on the wing for guidance, pointing back out again, ready for its next operational sortie. After flying closed, the airfield did still have one mission to fulfil. The domestic accommodation was used for people coming back from overseas to be demobbed, to be issued with their trilby hats and their brown suits. This is the beautifully kept Commonwealth War Graves Commission plot in the Church of Holy Trinity in the village of Warmwell. It contains 23 graves, 
22 of which are Second World War casualties. There are 11 pilots buried here, six of whom gave their lives during the Battle of Britain. Perhaps the most poignant of the headstones is this one here, the young soldier, Hayes, aged 17 of the Dorsetshire Regiment, who was guarding an ammunition dump at the airfield when a hurricane crashed on him in an abortive emergency landing. In the front here, we have the grave of Squadron Leader Lovell Gregg. He is another casualty of the Battle of Britain. Based at RAF Exeter, his aircraft crashed at Abbotsbury. He was killed in the crash and brought here to his final resting place. As well as the British casualties buried here, it's interesting to note in these 23 plots, we have people who came to join their comrades in arms for the fight against fascist tyranny from Australia, Canada, South Africa, Poland, and what was then Czechoslovakia. As you move around Dorset, you tend to see pillboxes all over the place and you might get the feeling that they've just been randomly dropped in spots, but that's not true. We have basically three types of pillbox installation. Single pillboxes defending an individual point, such as the one behind me, which we'll return to in a moment, and two stop lines. One stop line, the inland stop line, running basically from Maiden Newton to Pool, and then the coastal stop line running along the south coast, including the ones at West Bexington. This box was unusual in that it had seven firing positions in the 360 degrees of the box. Very thin compared with many pillboxes, and I can't help thinking that any weapon fire in excess of about 0.45 calibre would have wreaked havoc and the defenders inside, many of whom would have been home guard, would have stood no chance at all. It was located here specifically to guard the crossing of the River Froome. There was once a ford here, although now it has filled in. We're now out at Hurst Common, an enchanted woodland glade between the villages of Crossways and Afpuddle. And this seat here commemorates Sergeant Ronald Essex, a married man from Dorchester who was killed in the Second Battle of El Alamein on the 2nd of November 1942. The battle of which Winston Churchill says, this is not the beginning of the end, but it's certainly the end of the beginning. Sergeant Essex has no known grave and he's amongst nearly 12,000 names listed on the Unknown Warriors Memorial at the Battlefield Cemetery of Alamein. This is RAF Ringstead, a westerly extension of the South Coast radar chain which became operational after the Battle of Britain, in fact, not until May 1942. Here we have one of the seven bunkers at RAF Ringstead, inside with different compartments used for the broadcast and transmissions based here with the different aerials at this site. There was Chain Home and Chain Home Low. Chain Home was connected to the RAF. Chain Home Low also connected to the Naval Station at Portland. A war memorial is normally a plaque or occasionally a commemorative seat or even a village hall. But the memorial here to 20-year-old's Lieutenant David Parry Jones is rather different. It's a bus shelter. After the prolonged tank battles around Caen, the breakout from the Normandy beachhead was finally achieved and the next major objective for the Allies was the crossing of the River Seine. Lieutenant Parry Jones was a member of the 1st Battalion of the Rifle Brigade and had only been overseas for a week. He was killed during the race for the Seine, as it became known, on the 4th of August 1944. A Weymouth man remembered here in his native Dorset, Lieutenant Parry Jones lies at peace in the Commonwealth War Graves Commission plot on the outskirts of Bayeux.
Save for the island of Portland, this is the southernmost point on the Dorset coastline, St Oldham's Head. And despite the peaceful scenes we see here today, this place played a major part in the British war effort. From May 1940 until May 1942, the telecommunications establishment, TRE, a cover for radar, was based here between this headland and the village of Worth Matravers. Radar wasn't invented here, but many of the advances of radar during the war years came from TRE on this spot. The main radars used in the air defence chain were Chain Home and Chain Home Low. Chain Home Low being introduced to give the radars a better capability against low flying aircraft. In the early 1940s and through the Battle of Britain until the radar chain was extended westward to Ringstead, this site, although designed for experimental use, transmitted data by telephone, of course, back to the filter rooms and became part of the air defence chain. The important part in the war effort made by the scientists working at Bletchley Park, the scientists and mathematicians who broke the Enigma Code is well known, but perhaps not so well known is the part played by scientists of equal stature at Worth Matravers and the TRE. And we're very lucky to be joined by Dr Bill Penley, who was there during those two years when everything was happening. Radar was no longer in its infancy, it was being advanced. Could you tell us how radar progressed during the two years you were down on the Dorset coastline? There were quite a number of problems we knew about, of course. The chain, which had been uh, designed for operating on quite longer wavelengths, was not very good at detecting low-flying aircraft. And uh, as a result, of work that had been done by the army team, a coastal defence radars had been developed which were being converted for use as CHLs, chain home low radars for detecting low aircraft. But it was known that these were pretty inefficient and a lot of work had to be done. One team, uh, main team, was going round to improve the performance of the big CH stations by redesigning aerials and improving transmitter operations. And the other team, of which I was a member, was doing work on the CHLs to try to get them up to a proper operational standard. And that was how the situation was up till about July of 1940. We then had, of course, the scare of invasion. And in fact, we were all sent out to stop research work at the site and out to all the stations to titivate them up and try to make them work properly and in fact had to go and find new sites further down the coast to the um, west and then uh, because of course France had fallen and in fact we were in threat of invasion and, uh, and so these problems were with us. It was just about possible for us to cope with daylight raids. Now night attack is quite a different thing to cope with because you have to find individual bombers uh, in the dark and the AI, air interception equipment, had been started to be developed but these were rather crude and poor equipments. We hadn't got radars on the ground to direct the aircraft with the precision that was necessary to put the fighters in the right position to operate their AIs and so we had to start on a, a program of developing what was called GCI equipments, ground control interception equipments. We were very fortunate that uh, we were able to use the CD equipment, the coastal defence equipment that the army had developed for their purposes. And with their help, we had to make half a dozen equipments by the end of 1940. And the other area where, of course, radar was so important was to win the battle against the submarine. There had been some success with the ASV, air to surface vessel developments. The one and a half metre uh, wave band was used for the development of the first ASV, air to surface vessel equipments, and the one which was in service uh, gave quite good performance over the Bay of Biscay. Why did the personnel of TRE move away from here in May 1942 and recite to Malvern in Worcester? On the night of the 27th and 28th of February 1942, Airborne forces dropped in on a German radar site at Bruneville on the north coast of France. They captured some technicians, some secret equipment, and they brought it back to the UK in motor gunboats. Churchill was very impressed with this achievement, but decreed that by the next full moon, 
the secret work should be taken away from here because of course this location was so similar to Bruneville that he was worried that the Germans would carry out a copycat raid. And you must look back on it now and think, gosh, those were days. And probably at the time you didn't realise just how seminally important everything you were doing was. Well, it was really remarkable that young chaps like myself were given tremendous overriding authority. You know, you can't, it's unbelievable. Even at that time, I was, what, 25? And I was in charge at, at that time of the development of this ground control mm -hmm. interception yeah. stuff, you see. And, uh, you know, you said, I want this or I want that. And it happened, yeah. you see. You got top priority with all the industry and everything else. After the RAF left, a great gap was left in life on this headland, but in 2001 this beautiful memorial was erected commemorating those who served here. Sir Bernard Lovell, who we all know of as the boss up at Jodrell Bank Radio Telescope, he came here in 2001 and unveiled the memorial. Every year, the Borough of Weymouth and Portland holds a Veterans Festival to commemorate those who have given their lives in the service of our country. Today, we remember with deep gratitude the courage, devotion, an example of those who lay down their lives for our country. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. After the pomp and ceremony of the emotive parade, it's as well to pause and remember Weymouth's memorial, known as the British Memorial, which commemorates those who gave their lives in both of the great wars of the 20th century and those who in fact have given their lives for the country since. This second memorial is the American Memorial, commemorating American servicemen who died in the 1939 to 45 war but specifically it commemorates the part played by Weymouth and Portland, their harbours, in the D-Day landings and the period thereafter. During that period, 517,816 servicemen and over 144,000 vehicles sailed from Weymouth and Portland to the D-Day beaches. This second plaque commemorates the part played by the American Rangers on D-Day on the Pointe de Hoc, a headland between the Omaha and Utah beaches. This plaque commemorates not D-Day activity, but by the side of D-Day. On the 28th of April 1944, American forces were carrying out Exercise Tiger in Lion Bay when E-boats from Cherbourg got in amongst the friendly forces and wreaked havoc, and 749 personnel lost their lives 
in Lime Bay, and many of whose bodies were recovered to Portland. Particularly tragic was the loss of the troop ship Leopoldville. The last port of call for the soldiers on board there was the army camp at Piddle Hinton near Dorchester. They were waiting to reinforce the troops already in Europe when she was sunk by a German U-boat on Christmas Eve and 802 people died on that occasion. And so we end our tour of Dorset's war sites back at the Cross of Sacrifice in the Royal Naval Cemetery on Portland. And as we think of those who gave their lives in service of their countries, perhaps we ought to think of those immortal words of the exaltation. They shall grow not old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. <laughs>